Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the official Queens United Chess Podcast. I'm your host, Anisha Oberoi, co-hosting with Lapika Mullick, the creative director of Queens United Chess. Today's guest is a very inspirational icon. Appearing in the 2012 documentary, Brooklyn Castle, she went on to graduate from Stanford University and Columbia University, and is currently a law student at NYU, where she holds numerous leadership roles in student groups, including Women of Color Collective and the Suspension Representation Project. So without further, to, further ado, joining us today is Rochelle Ballantyne. Applause. <laughs> Thank you so Hi, much for joining for us on the me. Oh, sorry. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate your time. So, it's a pleasure. So today we really just want to start off by getting to know your story. What was your first introduction to chess? Sure. Okay. I've told this story so many times you'd think I'd have it memorized by now. Um, I was first taught chess by my grandmother. Uh, she, I was apparently a very rowdy kid when I was you know, eight, nine, like most rowdy kids are. Mm -hmm. Um, And um, she thought that playing chess would be a good way to like calm me down, to get me to focus, to keep me inside essentially. So that's how I first started playing. Um, She beat me a lot uh, and I was very upset because she was always winning and it was just so unfair. Um, but luckily there was a chess club, there was a new chess club starting at my elementary school. Um, so I joined the chess club out of spite so that I could beat her. Um, but then I kept beating other people and I thought that was pretty cool. Um, so yeah, that's how I got interested in chess. Not the, you know, best kid friendly answer, but. (laughs) And did your grandma have, um, tournament experience playing in chess? She did not. Um, she was a teacher in Trinidad, and so chess was one of the ways that she like engaged with her kids back there. That's okay. Um, so when did you really feel that you began to understand the passion you had for chess? Um, I don't know if there was like a specific moment. I think for me, I just really enjoyed winning. Um, I thought that you know, I'm the only black face. I'm one of the only few female faces. Um, And it felt good to kind of be the underdog, you know, like you walk into a chess tournament and people just automatically assume that they're going to beat you. uh, Mm -hmm. And then they were wrong almost every time. And, you know, that felt really good. So would you say that you were supported and grew up in an atmosphere that encouraged your love for chess? No. (laughs) Um. And I say that looking back now, I think at the time, um, I was definitely given all of the resources and the support um, to sort of keep playing and keep playing at a level that other kids were playing. Um, But I think on the emotional level, um, that wasn't as, that wasn't, I didn't feel as supportive in that sense um but at the time I like I was young I didn't know the language for like the things that were happening around me um the interpersonal characteristics that contributed to sort of like how I interacted in these spaces uh so I kind of brushed it off um but after a while that trauma builds and then you sort of understand kind of like oh I don't actually belong here And I think that kind of like sort of impacted as I got older. So who would you say was the person that continued to like help um, inspire you to continue playing chess while facing Um, things? Definitely my grandma and my mom. Uh, They were the ones who, my grandma was the one who like first wanted me to become the first African-American female chess master. After she passed, my mom took over that mantle and kept sort of supporting me um, in that goal. Uh, despite all of the other things that I was doing. So they're my biggest inspirations. Uh, if your grandma was here today, what was like, what is something that you'd want to tell her? Uh, thank you. Just thank you for everything. Um, 
she has poured so much into me, into her children, into her grandchildren. Uh, and I don't think she like, I hope she knows uh, that this journey would not be without, would not be, I would not be where I am without her uh, and her guidance. Um, and so I'm grateful and I hope, I don't think I was able to sort of appreciate her and give her all of her flowers while she was alive. And so if she was here, I would wanna do that first and foremost. Mm -hmm. So would you say, what would you say is your biggest obstacle or challenge that you had to face maybe mentally? Like, did you ever have a moment where you were like, I can't do this anymore? Or like, did you ever have to face those kind of internal struggles? Oh yeah, uh, there were, uh, I think when I started college, I quit. Uh, I quit when I, in high school kind of. Um, there have been numerous points in my life where I just like stopped playing because it wasn't fun for me anymore. Um, yeah. Um, do you play currently? Are you um, still involved? I do. I play every week. And you are a student at NYU right now, right? Right? Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> so how do you manage that? How do you balance those two things? That's that a must... great question. And once I figure out the answer, I promise you will be the first to know. <laughs> Oh, also you mentioned like, you mentioned how you like you took like break to like you quit at times. So like, what like motivated you to get back into it? Um, I think opportunities like these, talking to other female chess players, uh, talking to other Black and Brown kids who grew up in neighborhoods similar to mine, um, that pressure to sort of like attain the title was a, a large part of the reason I quit. But it's also a large part of the reason why I keep going. Uh, knowing that um, people look up to me, that that I am influencing others, um, that more women and more Black women and more Black and Brown kids in general are playing this game, I think is so inspiring. Um, and it really and truly is an honor to sort of like have paved the pathway for them. Um, and I don't take it for granted. And that's why I keep going. You definitely are an inspiration. We both look up wow. to you. Thank you. So what do you think is the most important skill for a chess player to have? Uh, I was, the first thing I was going to say was patience and I realized I don't have any, so I'm not going to lie. <laughs> um, I think the most important skill is grace. Um, and grace in the sense of losing is just a natural occurrence of chess and you have to be able to take your losses with grace, uh, to, to recognize that Sometimes you are gonna lose. What am I gonna take away from that loss? Uh, you can take away a lot from like every game you play in chess, the wins and the losses. How am I gonna take that loss, um, internalize it uh, so that I don't make the same mistake again? And I think that's a very underrated lesson in chess. So how would you mentally prepare yourself for a tournament? I listen to music and I, you know, just go in and be like, whatever happens, happens. Mm -hmm. I I'm prepared enough. And if I lose, it's because my opponent outprepared me. And how am I going to be better the next time around? I think that's some great advice because I think yeah. we all struggle with like kind of like pressuring ourselves before tournaments. So that's that's good to hear. No, yeah, you definitely have to ground yourself because chess is a lot. Chess is a, is a mind game, right? And so mm -hmm. it's a lot about you're going in knowing that, you know, you have, you can see the strategies and you can see your opponent's next moves and X, Y, Z, but maybe your opponent can see it better than you. And that's just something that I guess- You have to accept. Yeah. It just is what it is until you get to a point where now you can see it better than your opponent. And so grounding yourself before you go and just being like, you know, I'm the best right now. I'm, I'm at the best that I can be right now, but I can always be better. And maybe this game will teach me how to be better. Yeah, that's good. So what are some of your favorite chess openings? I hate this question. As <laughs> everyone knows, I do not study. <laughs> yeah. I'm not the best. Yes, I'm not the best chess studier. So there was a very long time where I didn't know a lot of openings at all. Mm -hmm. um, and I play what I do know. Um, but I'm getting better at that. I have a coach who's helping me. Mm -hmm do better. Um, but I really like to play the Joko. 
Um, I like to play openings that lead to crazy things. I love mm -hmm. a crazy middle game. Um, yeah. So what are some of the biggest impacts chess has made on your life? If it's been a part of you for so long, starting with your grandma teaching mm -hmm. you and what's, you know, carrying on to even today, how has it impacted you? Yeah, I think chess has uh, taught me a lot about who I am and the kind of person that I want to be. Um, chess has helped me meet people in different states, different countries. It has carried me all across the world. Um, chess has taught me the importance of losing, not just in chess, but in life um, and how to bounce back, you know, like sometimes life be life in and it knocks you down. And the important part is like, you know, how you get back up and to face like your your challenges. Chess has not taught me about patience. Um, you know, I think that's gonna be a lifelong journey for me to like learn how to be patient. Um, it has taught me to be strategic, like I'm now about to be a lawyer uh, and a large part of being a lawyer is thinking not about your moves, but your opponent's moves and how to counteract that. Um, yeah, I have carried chess every day in every space I, ent I enter um, and I'm grateful for all of the lessons. So in some ways did um, your love for chess kind of lead into your love for law or? Is no. No? Uh, oh, that's a good question. Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I want to say no, but I think like maybe the strategy, the always wanting to win, you know, that does sound like a like a lawyer. So maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. Yeah, probably. Um, but I think initially my love for law started from um, not the personal attributes, but more so just like my neighborhood. I wanted to change sort of the circumstances of kids who grew up in neighborhoods like mine. Um, and similarly, I guess that's what I'm doing with chess. So mm -hmm. yes, okay. the more I think about it, the more I think you're right. What would you have to say is your most memorable moment or greatest success in chess? Um, another good question. Mm. Even if it just being like the opportunity to be able to just like share your knowledge with and like inspire people. Yeah, I was gonna say there was this one tournament that I was at and um, these four little black girls from DC Chess Club um, came up to me and was like, you're Rochelle. And I was like, yes, I am. And they're like, we love you. And I was like, I'm gonna cry. <laughs> um, and yeah, so I think that was really, uh, memorable because I got to speak to their coach, Robin Ramson, and she was telling me how she was running this chess club full of little black girls. And that is, that was unheard of when I was growing up. Um, and so I think that was sort of, and she was like, yeah, we watch your your videos, we watch your movie. Um, these little girls want to be like you when I grow up, when they grow up. And I just thought that that was, yeah, that was the most yeah. beautiful, you know, that was my, that's my, that's my chess achievement right there. That's a great achievement. Yeah. <laughs> Impacting little girls everywhere. Thank you. So speaking of your movie, Brooklyn Castle, I wanted mm -hmm. to ask in 2012, you did star in the Brooklyn Castle documentary. And do you want to talk a little bit more about the documentary for those of our listeners who may not be as familiar? Yeah, sure. Um, okay, so Brooklyn Castle is a movie about my old um, junior high school, IS-318, and it sort of documents how we go from, you know, being the underdogs, essentially, to, like, winning national championships. Um, a lot of people love it because of the, like, chess kind of backdrop of, like, these kids um, going on to, like, face these very well-resourced uh predominantly white, predominantly male um, schools and beating them. Um, but I think the underlying component or maybe the not so subtle component of the movie is the fact that, you know, we do come from the, this poor, this predominantly poor junior high school um, where the mayor at the time was planning to like slash all of our after school budget, which includes included the chess program. And so 
despite all of those things that are against us, we were still able to like achieve success. Um, it's a story about sort of grit and growth. Um, but it's also a story about what happens when you take away resources from under under resourced communities. Um, look how much the the chess club has done for for students like me, um, the students who came before me, the students who came who come after me. Um, how important sort of pouring into our kids is in that way, so that they could achieve things like becoming the the national chess champions. Um, and so yeah, I think that's a lot. That's what the movie is about. How did like how did the movie come to life? Like what how did it start? Like who, you know, gave the idea or that is a good question that I actually do not have the answer to. I think that's a Katie question. I don't think I've ever asked her that. Uh I was just told that I could be in it uh -huh. and I thought that was cool. Um I was the chess captain at the time, so and I was a woman. So I think like that kind of played into yeah. it. Um but you would have to ask Katie sort of like what sparked this for her so um who do you think like played a big part in keeping the chess club alive when they were being like cut resources do you think that maybe it was you and like the other students like drive for chess that kept it alive if mm -hmm. i think it's part i think it's both i think it's definitely the students who like demonstrated that they wanted to keep playing that they wanted to keep winning uh but i think we have to give the adults their sort of part in dealing with the bureaucracy um, and continuing to fight for us, sending letters to, to, to town hall, is it town hall? The mayor's office, whoever, whichever government entity um, and fighting the battles that we couldn't fight or like fighting the battles with knowledge and language that we didn't have um, to advocate for us on our behalf. Um, because really we were just there to play chess and sort of they were the ones fighting the, the battles behind the scenes. So I definitely think it's a, it's a two part yeah. How did your um, coach impact your life in school? Um, yeah. So Miss, her, it was Miss Vickery. Now she's Mrs. Spiegel. Um, so Mrs. Spiegel was my first woman coach. Um, and I thought it was so cool that she achieved all of this success as a woman. Um, and now she was here teaching us. Mm -hmm. I thought that was incredible. Mm -hmm. um, and I really leaned on her a lot for sort of not just how to be a better chess player, but also how isolating it is to be a female chess player. Um, and so she was able to support me in that sense. She's also incredibly dedicated to her students. Um, she would print out packets for us. She would, she was at every chess tournament. Um, she really gave us everything, all, all that she has. Um, and I think that that is sort of a testament to why I do the work that I do now. Um, teachers are underpaid and under-resourced um, and they still pour so much into the, to the students that they work with um, and don't deserve or don't get the credit that they deserve. Uh, and I think she is one of those sort of reminders of how important teachers are to mm -hmm fostering the future do you perhaps like somehow in the future you know want to teach kids or maybe Absolutely start like not. a chess club nope. no <laughs> you know i think everyone has their ministry i know mine and it is not a teacher <laughs> oh, that's understood me too <laughs> so what was your biggest and still is your biggest hope for the documentary when people watch the film how do you what do you want people to feel or understand I want people to understand how important education is to children, how important it is to fund education for children, because um, it doesn't have to be a chess club. It could be a band club. It could be robotics. It could be any sort of like after school enrichment activity. Um, but it's important to provide kids with sort of activities that could possibly that they could possibly be interested in and to provide kids with a wide array of those activities um, so that they know that the world is bigger than their neighborhood, um, that they have access to, to things that can like maybe help them to decide what they wanna do in the future, um, that they feel loved and cared for. I hope mm -hmm. that's what people take away is that like, if anything, education should be the number one thing we, we pour our money into. Um, 
And I hope more people realize that in the future. 100%, I agree. When the documentary came out, what was the support like from your friends and family? How did your community- Oh, they made fun of me all the time. (laughs) (laughs) They didn't get to see 13, 14, 15 year old Rochelle. And um, you know, that Rochelle was very sassy. She had a bit of an attitude problem. Um, and you know, they definitely took advantage of that. I'm a, a bit more refined now. So they got to see a side of me that they've never seen before and they will never let me live it down. Um, on the other hand, they also like thought that it was really cool and, and really inspiring. I don't tell a lot of people that I am in a movie, let alone play chess. And so like when they saw the movie, they were like, what in the world? We didn't know. Um, so yeah, so that's always fun. In school, did you not have a lot of friends that play chess? Was it mainly like an interest that you had? Or yeah, in high school, definitely. Um, but I joined the chess in the schools program and they do sort of like a college bound program where for kids who are interested in chess. Um, but outside of that, I didn't have chess friends, a lot of chess friends. Um, outside of like the folks that I met at tournaments Mm -hmm. at Stanford, definitely not. Uh, Yeah. And do you think that that's part of the reason why maybe once you went to college, you started maybe drifting away from chess? Because sure. Yeah, because if you don't have a support system and also chess is like really expensive. And so, yeah, if you don't have like support mechanisms in place and it becomes harder to, to keep playing. Going down the road, where do you hope to see yourself in the in like your chess future, your chess career? I really want to make master. Yes, um, and that's really it. I you know, uh, grandmaster seems really hard. Uh, making master is really hard, uh, but I think for right now, I really want to be master. And then, if I still play after that then I'll shoot for Grandmaster. But if not, I will be really content being mm-hmm. uh, the first female chess master or black female chess master. Is there anything you're like doing right now to like help you get there? Yes, I'm playing every week. I have a chess coach that I work with. Um, I'm trying to make more time to sort of do the things I didn't do when I was younger, which is study. <laughs> What impact do you hope to leave on the chess community? I hope that more people realize that the hardest part about playing chess isn't the game itself. Um, It's a money issue. It's a race issue. It's a gender issue. Um, And the chess community doesn't make it easy for non-white male people to play. Um, And I hope that me and other predominant, or sorry, me and other women, other black people um, who have like reached our, my my level and higher, um, sort of open the doors to more of those, to more, to have more of those conversations, to make chess more accessible. are there any projects you're like currently involved in either in chess or outside of chess? What do you mean? Like just in general, like anything you're like working toward, like you said you're masters, but um, anything besides that, like in NYU? Oh, graduating law school, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> How's I that going? Is it? I graduated in May, so I'm uh-huh. close. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I take the bar in July and you know, that's Good luck. Really it. Yeah, Thank you. <laughs> um, I'm on the board of a few chess organizations uh, to kind of work on making chess more accessible. So that's been interesting. I haven't been on the bureaucracy side before, so mm-hmm. I'm excited to see what comes of that. Um, but yeah, other than that, trying to graduate, trying to be a chess master, easy, easy. easy. <laughs> and finally to wrap up the episode i just wanted to ask like what would be your biggest piece of advice to any young female chess players trying to like find a, like a more inclusive environment to play chess in um 
you might not. You might not find that environment you're looking for where you're at specifically, but there are so many more girls playing than when I was playing. And so they do exist. They might not be in your specific state, but we are everywhere and we can support you from anywhere. Um, so don't be afraid to reach out. If I personally can't help, I will find someone who will who, or who can. Um, but I think most importantly, don't let that detract you from being an incredible chess player. Uh, if you're playing chess, it's because you're smart and you have the wherewithal to like keep playing. And so keep playing if you want to. If you don't want to, then of course, mm -hmm. <laughs> don't. But if you really want to, don't let the isolation be the reason you stop playing. Don't let anyone like bring you down. Just keep going. Yeah, keep going. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to sit down and have this conversation with us. We really do appreciate your time coming on the podcast. Miss Valentine, you are such an inspiration to so many young female chess players. Thank you for everything you're doing for the chess community and even beyond that. And to all our viewers out there, I hope today you were able to learn more about Rochelle Valentine and her incredible story. That is all I have for you today, though, but make sure to stay tuned for our next episode. This has been Anisha Oberoi. And Lapika Malik. Thanks, Thanks for tuning in. <laughs>